Good morning and welcome to today's session of the NPTEL course in Infection in English. In one of the introductory sessions, we noted that in Rushdie's introduction to his vintage book of Indian writing, he identified parochialism as perhaps the greatest vice, regional writing. What he had in mind was the pan-Indianness, the almost national appeal that the setting, the context and the uh, the overall themes of Indian writing in English had to offer vis-a-vis -vis regional writing. At a later point, indicating the anxiety of Indianness that most writers in English had, Minakshi Mukherjee further pointed out that the absence of a regional locale or even the absence of a known regional readership that made Indian writing in English perhaps a lag behind regional writing, at least in certain ways. So that there are these two diverse viewpoints that we do have in the context of Indian writing in English as of now. We have writers like Rushdie arguing for a pan indianness that Indian writing in English has vis-a-vis -vis regional writings. And we have critics such as Minakshi Mukherjee who uh, point out that it is the regional, it's the value of the local that perhaps uh, forces many critics to prioritize regional writing in terms of its uh, critical value, in terms of its critical tradition more than uh, Indian writing in English, which of course has a larger uh, global appeal. In this context, it would also be interesting to notice that in most of the Indian English uh, fiction that we have been discussing, though there is a certain kind of a national or even international appeal that most of these uh, novels claim, in spite of that there is a focus on certain regional local settings. And here we also realize that it is possible to identify certain patterns across periods from the early 1930s onwards. The setting in the early novels, it was mostly rural India, it was country life which was getting prioritized over uh, the urban life. The country the countryside, the rural setting was uh, seen as more responsive to the nationalist movement. It, uh, for whatsoever reason, it was seen as the uh, place where it was easy to talk about Indianness. It was easy to present the uh, the local uh, rural setting as the as a representative of Indian life. We find this getting exemplified in Raja Rao's Kantapura, which is entirely set in a village named Kantapura. Anand's Untouchable, where also we find the action focuses on one person mostly and life in that particular town. And we also find Narayan even inventing a fictional village, which also later becomes a sort of a, uh, a town, a semi-urban place, which is Malgudi. So, the setting in the early novels were mostly rural centric, it is away from all the vices of the city, everything which is not urban. We do find this gradually changing and in the contemporary it would be quite safe to say that most writings are city centered, there are urban locales. Of course, we do have certain novels such as Upamanyu uh, Chatterjee's English August or uh, uh, Shashi Daru's Riot and Amitav Ghosh's Hungry Tide where the setting is away from the city, from the metropolis, but the story revolves around a city bred modern secular male and that uh, really brings up a lot of urbanness even to the narration. Uh, there is a kind of uh, a city centeredness which becomes part of the storytelling process itself and in the contemporary we also find that this shift from the village setting, this shift from the rural has been very marked and the shift has been to these large metropolitan cities, to Bombay, to Calcutta, to Delhi and these days we also find Adiga presenting Bangalore also as one of the emerging urban centers. And we find uh, writers like Amitav Ghosh, Vikram Seth, Jumba Lahiri, uh, Amit Chaudhary, they are all focusing mostly on Calcutta and uh, if you recall most of Amitav course novels are set in Calcutta and Bombay also emerges as another important center particularly in the novels of Rashti Desai and many others that we would take a look at and this focus on a particular cosmopolitan city 
it can be seen in two ways one there is a certain regionality there is a certain uh, uh, local flavor which uh, gets introduced but at the same time the character of these metropolitan cities the character of these cosmopolitan cities they also give a certain kind of a pan indianness to uh, the uh, the entire setting Minakshi Mukherjee uses this interesting term the third world uh, cosmopolitans to talk about these kind of writers and there certainly is a kind of urban cosmopolitanism which gets celebrated in most of these writings and uh, unlike the earlier writings where they find it uh, compulsory almost compulsory to talk about Indian fiction and then place its setting within an entirely rural background we do not find the contemporary writers operating under such a uh, compulsion it uh, could be because of the kind of different experiences and the exposure that the current writers and the current uh, targeted audience are exposed to uh, but uh, it also has to do with the fact that English is increasingly merging as a metropolitan language not to say that in the 1930s when Kantapura was getting published or when Untouchable or uh, Narayan's novels came out there was a difference uh, but it was increasingly important then to present the rural the rustic the non-urban as an Indian space and this has definitely changed for good and that's one inclusive thing which has become part of uh, uh, Indian writing in English but uh, the critics also uh, point out how there is a certain lopsidedness in the contemporary uh, uh, settings in the contemporary presentation in the narrative uh, 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 locations because there is an over prioritization of the urban at the cost of almost ignoring the uh, rural as well as the inhabitants who are there in these non-urban spaces. The focus of today's lecture is particularly to see how certain metropolitan cities have been uh, seen as perhaps the most preferred settings as far as Indian writers and English are concerned and Shahani who wrote this essay Polyphonous Voices in the City and he points out that as novelists they are creating Bombay's of their imagination. The city is fashioned in the writer's own image, the ceasing to be the geographical territory and becoming instead an imagined topos, nor do the narratives record history, they fictionalize it. So there is certainly a purpose, a larger purpose which, in, which is getting served and this purpose is quite akin to the nationalist project that we can identify in most of the contemporary writings where the nation gets narrated in particular ways where this presentation of the city also by extension becomes another imagined place where the action centers and we focus this lecture mostly on these two cities Bombay and Calcutta and how they get represented in the space of Indian fiction in English and we also identify the various possibilities which have been pointed out by critics as well as writers when these metropolitan uh, centers become the focus of action. A set of writers have been identified as Bombay writers uh, but, uh, mostly Salman Rushdie, Shashi Deshpande, Anita Desai, Rohinton Mastri, Gurcharan Das and Firdaus Kanga. Uh, Firdaus Kanga in one of his novels uh, published in 2009 he also makes one character talk about how you can look at a scene from a thousand different windows and you will see something new each time. So that's a possibility that Bombay offers to most of these writers and we find them presenting the city and making use of the immense possibility that the city offers to them as a narrative space as an imaginative space there is a possibility to imagine and reimagine this city in multiple ways they begin to show us bomb gardeners bombay is perhaps one of the celebrated novels as far as this uh, representation of the city is concerned written by anita desai when we read the novel and when we try to analyze it we realize that the city the city which is present at Bombay, it's neither Baumgartner's nor the SIS. It's a different new city which emerges altogether. Baumgartner is an exiled Jew. In the uh, uh, story, in the novel, we find Baumgartner being presented as someone forever rebuffed by the city, forever in search of a homeland. Uh, we can see this getting replicated in Anita Desai's own life as her, in her own approach to uh, the way she relate with the city, relate with the nation.
there's an all-pervading nihilism which at least occasionally we find getting reflected in Anita Desai's own approach to her homeland when she chooses to reside or not to reside in a particular place. And almost similar reflection could be found in Shashi Deshpande's uh, uh, two of her works, uh, That Long Silence and The Dark Holds No Terrors. Uh, in uh, both these novels, That Long Silence and The Dark Holds No Terrors, she tries to critique Bombay's elite world. And even within this metropolitan space, we find that there are, of course, divisions and there is a way in which these writers choose to focus on certain strata of society, a certain class. And here, when uh, Shishi Deshpande is trying to critique the elite world within Bombay, there are two things that she tries to highlight. One is a strong sense of individuation that definitely is seen as a positive thing, but at the same time, the flip side is that a sense of community is getting completely lost. And Shashi Deshpande does not present the city in an entirely nostalgic way. She is very critical about what the city offers. She also presents the city as representing the patriarchal setup and bourgeois aspirations. She also has women characters who are successful, who are placed as protagonists. And she also tells us through her narration that these women, these women protagonists with successful careers, they perhaps would not have made it big had they been placed in any other city in India. Because Bombay, more than any other Indian city, it has the scope to offer these kinds of newer possibilities. This is what Deshpande's novels, uh, they, they seem to try to tell us. But nevertheless, the city is not entirely depicted in positive, nostalgic terms. There is also a strong critique, a strong underlying critique that Deshpande tries to present through her novels, particularly in these two ones, That Long Silence and The Dark Holds No Terrors. When we talk about Bombay writers, it is only natural that one talks more about Salman Rushdie. He was the one who had uh, given a more positive perspective on Bombay, right from his first celebrated novel, uh, Midnight's Children, we find the presence of Bombay being very compelling in uh, his entire uh, career. Rishti, interestingly, has very little lived experience in Bombay. Though he was born in Bombay, there uh, is uh, hardly anything that he can claim to be of a personal lived experience as far as his relationship with the city is concerned. But uh, nevertheless, he continues to write about Bombay and he finds that he is rooted in Bombay in spite of everything. People have tried to read this and interpret this in multiple ways. And one of the most dominant interpretations is that this is perhaps the need for the emigrant to reclaim the lost Atlantis of his growing years. And this gets all the more ironical when we notice that uh, Bombay itself is reclaimed land, reclaimed from the sea. And there is a nostalgia that we find in most of Rushdie's writings, it becomes all the more highlighted and very direct in his uh, 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 a collection of essays, Imaginary Homelands, where he talks about the nostalgia and the need for remembering the homeland. He talks about how even Midnight's Children is entirely about memory, entirely about what Salim Sinai is able to remember. There are, of course, you know, in uh, the essay, uh, The Errata and Midnight's Children, he talks about the many uh, errors which are part of the narration uh, in, in, in terms of the local train timings or when he is describing a particular locality, there have errors which have come in and this he says is the error of the memory. So the city which Rashti creates, rather recreates, need not be the real city. It is the one which he imagines in his mind as his homeland. And uh, uh, it's possible to argue that in Midnight's Children, we find Rushdi creating a Bombay of the mind. And the text being self-reflexive, it also tells us that it is actually creating a Bombay of the mind. And Bombay in Rushdi's mind becomes a lost boyhood home. So the presentation of Bombay, it's not in terms of Mumbai, the uh, uh, metropolitan cosmopolitan city, but in terms of the nostalgic relation that this writer has with the city. And in this process, perhaps Rushdie is also trying to reclaim that life which he never had in terms of his relationship with the nation. Some are of the opinion that the chutnification of English that Rushdie talks about it has been made possible through the use of Bombay's English. In Rushdie's own words, in Bombay you can understand these various kinds of Bombay English that might have a mixture of 
English in Gujarati or English in Marathi or English in Hindi or English in Urdu. But I couldn't get into that problem because that could have been a terrible tangle. We do not find Rishvi getting into that problem, but we find him problematizing it further. We find him capitalizing on that problem and creating a new kind of English, a new kind of language which many have also said that uh, it has liberated uh, the post-colonial nation from the shackles of uh, uh, the colonial tongue, from the shackles of, um, uh, from, from the straitjacket of uh, Macaulay, away from the Macaulayan mandates, there is a new kind of English which gets presented, which also can be attributed to the hybrid nature of the city, to this uh, uh, inclusive accommodating nature of the city. And it becomes also a convenient site where Rashti can enunciate this fictional recreation of his version of the nation's history. So there are these multiple possibilities in terms of uh, language, in terms of history, in terms of uh, uh, representation that Bombay continues to offer. Vikram Chandra is another writer who has chosen Bombay mostly as his uh, settings and uh, the short story collection Love and Longing in Bombay. It's mostly based on the experiences that he had while living uh, in Bombay. Responding to a strong critique by Minakshi Mukherjee about the authenticity of uh, uh, his presentation about the way in which Chandra perhaps deliberately tries to sell this exotic land to the West, Chandra uh, began to argue that he, his, that he also has his share of a regional identity. Uh, Minakshi Mukherjee's uh, critiques as we know, uh, uh, especially the later writings has focused a lot on how there is a burden for the Indian writer in English to write about India. There is an anxiety of Indianness because they are trying to sell this exotic land, sell their exotic experience to a predominantly western audience. Vikram Chandra had not taken this critique very kindly. He had written a very scathing critique attacking most of the critics uh, who are writing uh, about Indian writing in English and he therefore began to argue that he also has a regional Indian identity just like any other regional uh, Indian writer and he challenges this notion that he is writing from a position of being abroad because he also has his fair share of experiences through which he can claim his regionality. In his own words, I must respectfully submit that I too am a regional writer. I will not presume to claim Maharashtra or even the entire city of Bombay as my region. I will only claim part of the western suburbs, let's say north from the highway junction at Mahim Causeway, roughly an area containing Tharavi, Bandra West, Khar, Santa Cruz Antheri West and Gurega West. This is my region. I live in it, in the locality of Antheri, in the colony called Lokhanwala. So this is how Vikram Chandra likes to situate himself, his uh, uh, regionality gets presented in these details that he is uh, getting into. And unlike the prevalent argument that the city of Bombay offers a co cosmopolitanism which makes it easier for the Indian writer in English to sell their work, sell their setting to a predominantly Western audience, Vikram Chandra claims for a regional cosmopolitanism. We may have different reasons to to disagree with him, but nevertheless it is important to pay attention to the line of argument that he puts forward. My region is a hugely cosmopolitan place. Every single person who lives in my region is a cosmopolitan. I am of course a cosmopolitan. I travel away from my region every few months to make a living. My neighbors do also. There are the Gujarati diamond merchants who spend three weeks out of every four traveling from Africa to Belgium to Holland, flight attendants who fly to Beijing businessmen who sell textiles in Australia, mechanics and welders and engineers who keep Saudi Arabia running, merchant navy sailors who carry cargo to Brazil, nurses who give care and nurture in Sharjah, and gangsters who shuttle between Bombay and Indonesia and Dubai as part of their everyday trade. There is a claim for authenticity as well, where Sundra puts forward here, trying to argue that it is not just the regional writer who can claim to know the setting that they are presenting but a writer like Chandra also has his rightful share in that. Here we find Chandra putting forward a claim which is entirely different from that of uh, Rashti. Rashti does not claim to know the details as they are there. Rashti does not claim to know everything about the city 
On the other hand, he claims that he is conveniently recreating it out of his memory, out of an experience which he never had. And this, this is an important distinction for us to pay attention to. And uh, Chandra perhaps also has a claim because the gangsters that he uh, mentions here about the gangsters who shuttle between Bombay and Indonesia and Dubai as part of their everyday trade. Uh, the, this essay also talks about Chandra's response to Meenakshi Mukherjee also talks about his interactions with this uh, you know, Bombay underworld. And uh, he has, uh, he perhaps has a point because uh, his novel Sacred Games uh, which uh, followed soon after this uh, vitriolic attack on uh, Meenakshi Mukherjee, it's also based on gangsters in uh, Mumbai. Now we look at Rohinton mystery and his uh, kind of writing. We find in mystery in quite similar ways like that of Rushdie, a uh, need to return and to retrieve through his fiction the minuscule Parsi community of Bombay. Uh, we do find that his novels uh, such as uh, uh, A Fine Balance, they focus on uh, the city, there is uh, a representation of the Parsi community, he also tries to include marginal characters as far as possible and for him the Parsi bug and the city those are those are uh, a powerful means of rooting himself and there is an attempt which he makes to retrieve his own self in this process just like perhaps uh, rush the uh, dozen midnight's children and here also many critics have identified the immigrants need for community and identification because this city which otherwise critics argue that do not belong to them on account of them having you know predominantly uh, lived experiences abroad, they begin to totally subvert that claim by retrieving the city through their fiction and claiming some kind of a uh, belongingness in, through that process. So uh, we really do not know whether it is the charm of the city which forces these uh, uh, representations or uh, is it like the critics point out the immigrants need for community and identification. Bombay in mysteries works, we find that it becomes a metaphor for two antithetical states of mind. On the one hand, it is an image of him being in exile and on the other, it also becomes a means for communication. So Bombay is serving two purposes, polarized from each other, one of exile and one of communication. Uh, Rohinton Mysteries novel such a long journey, it is located in Bombay. For uh, Rushdi and Mystery, it, we can say that uh, Bombay is a city of memory. Uh, in Rushdi, we find Bombay encapsulating this country's multicultural diversity and its secular ideology. In Rushdi's own words, which, uh, uh, in, which appear in uh, his collection of essays, Imaginary Homelands, he says that it has something to do with the nature of Bombay, a metropolis in which the multiplicity of commingled faiths and cultures so curiously creates a remarkably secular ambience. So at the end of the day, it also serves the larger purpose that Rushdi or perhaps mystery have in mind to present a nation, present the story of a nation which is predominantly modern, secular and not given to any kind of uh, vices such as parochialism. And it also serves the larger purpose of uh, uh, finding an audience even outside the regional uh, setting. In this lecture, our attempt has not been to really show how the city is represented in most Indian uh, fiction, but to demonstrate the possibilities of reading Indian fiction in English in multiple ways about the possibility of countering the many arguments which have been put forward by critics, questioning the authenticity, the Indianness, and even the non rootedness of. Uh, Indian writers who have lived experiences abroad or who are currently not based in this nation. For Kanga, for Firdaus Kanga, who has also written extensively about Bombay, the city is an epicurean delight. But for the Desai and Deshpande, as we have noted, the city also emerges as symbols of isolation and even terror. So there is a certain kind of a malleability that the city presence to these writers, it can become whatever they want in their hands depending on their needs. And this is quite unlike the presentation of Calcutta. Many have pointed out that the writers writing about Calcutta, there is a tendency for them to focus on the past of the city, the past life of uh, uh, Calcutta as a city rather than uh, writing about it from a contemporary point of view. 
Many have give, uh, given different reasons for it. Many writers such as Amitav Kosh, who also has researched extensively on the uh, history and the past of the city. They have also pointed out that it could also it could be perhaps they do not have a contemporary lived experience. They are talking about the experience that hey, they had at some point of time during their college days or during their childhood. Uh, so unlike that, we find the city of Bombay getting represented in multiple ways in a, in a way just like Rishti would argue exposing the multicultural uh, dimension and the uh, multilingual dimension uh, the various possibilities in that sense that the nation itself offers. It can become a city of nostalgia, it can become a city of uh, immense possibilities, it can become a city of terror like it does in a fine balance or uh, how it can become almost both in, uh, as we would say in some of Desh Pandey's novels. In, in Firdaus Ganga's uh, novel, one of his uh, novels trying to grow, there is a scene where the protagonist is watching from lofty heights the colorful uh, cavalcade of uh, Kolaba Causeway. It's, it's far below and the protagonist also feels that uh, he is like Pope in his Vatican. Roshan Shahani points out that though unintentionally, there is a panoramic perspective which is offered from the viewpoint of the privileged. It's seen as the city is seen as exceedingly picturesque when seen from towering heights and remote distances. So this is something that we also need to bear in mind. Most of these writers writing in English with a lived experience in the city or outside, their viewpoint, their presentation is largely from the subject position of a privileged person and that is what makes uh, the city exotic for them. And again coming back to critics such as Minakshi Mukherjee, that is what perhaps sells well for them in terms of its uh, exotic element for a western audience. Uh, Roshan Shahani's essay Polyphonous Voices in the City, Bombay's Indian English Fiction, uh, it is uh, one among the very few works which uh, has looked at how the city gets presented in the space of Indian fiction in English. This is an essay which appeared in EPW in 1995. This lecture has also drawn extensively from Shahani's work. And towards uh, his uh, conclusion, Shahani points out, if culture is to be truly pluralistic and if Bombay is to epitomize that plurality, then the writers in English have a legitimate right to appropriate the city if it helps them to root themselves anew or conversely if it helps them to externalize their sense of rootlessness. By writing about Bombay, writers like Rushdie have charted anew the cultural map of the world. Bombay has also created space for many other writers who are cartographing other maps. So the way forward is perhaps to look at this just uh, from the point of view of Shahani, not to evaluate, not to judge these writers whether their experience and their representations are authentic or not but to see the immense possibilities that even such a kind of a narration has for us and how these kinds of representation also makes space for many newer kinds of articulations. As we wrap up this lecture, I would like to read out to you an excerpt from Krishna Datta's uh, work Calcutta, A Cultural and Literary History. It also had a foreword by Anita Desai who had written about Calcutta as well. Yeah. So her experience in terms of uh, writing about Calcutta, that was entirely different. Uh, she also of course spoke about the past of Calcutta, present the period during which she had spent her time in the city. And Anita Desai also had spoken about the influence of language, how English language itself changes in this process of narrating the experience in one particular city. In her own words, can the English language convey thoughts, emotions and situations that are alien to English experience? What about those that have grown out of the contact of the two languages, a contact which has infiltrated many English words into Bengali and few vice versa as such as uh, Bangalore? where they have taken a connotation and flavor very different from their usage in English. This is an important question that Anita Desai asks and what struck me as interesting is Krishna Dutta's attempt to respond to it. Krishna Dutta rightfully says the answers remain unclear. The huge success of Indian writers in English in recent years 
suggests that English can cope with any experience. And this is perhaps a positive note which continues to be encouraging as far as this field of Indian writing in English, Indian fiction in English is concerned. There is an immense possibility that this field of writing, this area of writing has opened up and the Englishes which are available in these metropolitan centers, it has grown so large, it has grown so accommodating that it is possible for that kind of language emerging from these metropolitan centers to cope with any experience. So on that note, we wrap up this lecture. I thank you for listening and I look forward to seeing you in the next session.